Welcome, everybody, to the Sacrament of Shabbat. Good Shabbat to everybody, and welcome. Today, we continue our discussion of uh, the book of Ecclesiastes. This is part seven of a series of talks on Ecclesiastes. Currently, we're at the end of chapter five, and we'll be looking at chapter six also today of Ecclesiastes. Many of these themes repeat themselves in different ways from different perspectives. But what I like to begin for those that are just entering into this series is the main famous line, so to speak, one of the most famous lines, at least, of Ecclesiastes, which is vanity of vanities, which does not mean meaninglessness or that life is meaningful, meaningless. It does not mean that life is vain in the sense of when you look in a mirror, you're vain because you appreciate how you look, or you're prideful. But the Hebrew word that was translated as vanity was havel or habel, which means illusory. So it's saying illusion of illusions. And what the writer of Ecclesiastes was essentially writing about in a sometimes very serious and a sometimes sarcastic way was that all of life is impermanent. Humanity tends to focus on the here and now, which does have to happen. And in fact, the writer of Ecclesiastes goes into that a little bit today. But also, we tend to overfocus on material reality. And as my spiritual master used to always say it, we really feed materialism and we starve our souls. And that's kind of the direction that Ecclesiastes writes about, too, in the verses of this particular book from the Hebrew Testament. So we'll continue now with this illusory nature of the world, this sense of impermanence that we're trying to get some ground under our feet by seeking permanent pleasure in impermanent things. But also, this is the first time, notably, in this series where the author says that we should be enjoying those material things also. Even though they are illusory, we should still be enjoying the rightful earnings of our work, whatever that work is. So let's look at Ecclesiastes 5, 13 through 16. There's a grievous ill that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owners to their hurt. And those riches were lost in a bad venture. Though they are parents of children, they have nothing in their hands. As they came from their mother's womb, so they shall go again, naked as they came. They shall take nothing for their toil, which they may carry away with their hands. This also is a grievous ill. Just as they came, so shall they go. And what gain do they have from toiling for the wind? So the first part I'd like to talk about is underlined at the top here. Uh, riches were kept by their owners to their own hurt. Of course, we are definitely meant to earn things to take care of ourselves, to make ourselves comfortable in such a way that we can focus on God. If money is not a bad thing, that is not what Ecclesiastes is ever saying. Whenever, although sometimes it's interpreted at different points that the author is saying that. But it's just simply not the case. And we'll see that, I believe, in the next slide. We do need to earn money. And we need to earn it through rightful sources that don't hurt or steps in the, step on the backs of others to lift us up in the world. We need to earn money for our own comfort because if, we're, if we don't have a roof over our head, if we don't have food, if we don't have money to survive, then most people are just struggling to survive. And they can't focus on God in any deep way because they're just trying to make it from day to day. And unfortunately, this is, the, this is the reality for a lot of people in the world. Probably more than 80% of the people in the world, I would guess, don't have enough money to eat three meals a day. Only 70% of the world has fresh, clean water to drink. That should be a big eye-opener. So. Some people tend to be more fortunate than others. And I believe that I'm one of those people too. And I'm very grateful to have the things that I have. But also, 
whenever we have enough for ourselves and there's a surplus of money, that extra money, at least in part, should be used to alleviate the suffering of people near to us. I mean, there's a lot of people suffering in every country of the world, but I'm sure that if we looked in our own neighborhoods or nearby in a, near si in a nearby city, we can find children that don't have enough food. Uh, our elders who are trying to decide whether they should pay for medicine, heat, or food, right? Or even rent, for that matter. So there's so much suffering all around us. And if we can somehow help people around us with the extra funds or extra resources we may have, like extra food, for example, that really helps people. But if we have an abundance of stuff that we save or that we just put back into the money market or we put into a savings account, we're keeping riches that contribute to our own hurt. And that is a spiritual hurt because our hearts are meant to open up the needs of vulnerable people around us. And if our hearts are not opening up to the vulnerable people around us, then that is a major portion of the teachings of the master Jesus that we aren't doing. A major part of Jesus's teachings, he had a threefold style of teaching, outer teachings, inner teachings, and secret teachings. This is all in the Bible, right? Outer teachings, like feeding the poor. Did you, you, you saw me naked, did you clothe me? You saw me hungry, did you feed me? You saw me thirsty, did you give me drink? You saw me in a prison, did you not come to visit me? All these things Jesus is encouraging us to do, right? So that's the outer work. It is the prerequisite for true inner spiritual growth, true mystical growth, so to speak. So if we're not doing the outer work, there's no way we can attain any true height of mystical realization, of soul realization, of God consciousness or communion with God. If you're not doing the basics of helping the people around you, it is hurting you because you cannot spiritually progress. And depending on how you use that money, which can sometimes hurt others, then you're really creating some spiritual debt for yourself or bad karma, so to speak. So, and again, they're, they're the inner teachings of Jesus that are meant to purify your heart, to examine your mind and your conscience. And then there are inner spiritual teachings, uh, which some may think is a bunch of uh, hogwash, but it's, it's not. Because Jesus said, what, what, you have learned, what, what you have learned in secret, the world longs to know. So apparently there are things that he taught certain disciples that he didn't teach the public. And certain traditions of Christianity, including ours, hold certain facets of that teaching that we can share with the public for those that truly want to deeply go into the spiritual path. They're not superficial seekers. Yes, believe in Jesus, but want to do the teachings. Do you want to really do those teachings? And part of doing the teachings is that if we have a surplus, and I'm not saying give away all of your rainy day fund, but we should be willing to give something back to humanity to make the world a better place. Here, the right of Ecclesiastes is saying, but instead of helping the vulnerable, we put our money into different bad business ventures and lose everything to the extent that we can't even give something to our children, much less people that are vulnerable around us that we may not know. And then that takes away all the spiritual value of what we can use our money for, use our resources for. The human ego is what separates us from God. We put so much value in our personal, physical, mental, and emotional comfort. And again, we should have a basis of comfort in ourselves and then extend some of our surplus to others that are in need. But if we're not doing that, we go spiritually bankrupt, even if we do become rich and don't lose it in a bad business venture. So the writer of Ecclesiastes reminds us that we come into this world naked and then we leave this world naked meaning without any acquisitions or money that we may have attained through our toil, through our work. So he says, as they came from their mother's womb naked, 
they shall take nothing for their toil. Naked as they come, they shall take nothing for their toil, which they may carry away with their hands. Meaning we come into the world naked and vulnerable and we die vulnerable. And naked at death means that you just, you don't have anything. You can't take anything from this world with you, wherever it is that we go. The author sums it up by saying this also is a grievous ill, just as they came, so shall they go. And what gain do they have from toiling for the wind? So people are trying to hold on to money and on to houses and on resources and cars, but it's like trying to catch the wind. You can't. You try to catch the air and it leaves. <laughs> if you close your, there's air in the center of my hand, there's air in the center of my hand, and then oh, nothing in my hand. I can never catch the wind. I can never catch the air. But yet we're trying to catch pleasure all the time in the world through physical resources, through materialism. And in the end, we just can't grasp it. Even if we can manage to keep that wealth throughout our life, at the time of death, we have to leave it behind. So, and this is something the author has stated before previously, but he's revisiting it again. And now he seems to take a different stance. And this is the first time in Ecclesiastes where the author is not being sarcastic about eat, drink, and be merry as he was before in our prior uh, talks on Ecclesiastes. Here he's being very straightforward. Ecclesiastes 6, 1 through 6. There's an evil that I have seen under the sun, and it lies heavy upon humankind. Those to whom God gives wealth, possessions, and honor, so that they lack nothing of all that they desire, yet God does not enable them to enjoy these things, but a stranger enjoys them. This is vanity. This is illusory. It is a grievous ill. A man may beget a hundred children and live many years, but however many are the days of his years, if he does not enjoy life's good things or has no burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. For it comes into vanity and goes into darkness, and in darkness its name is covered. Moreover, it is not seen, the sun, or known anything, yet it finds rest rather than he. Even though he should live a thousand years twice over, yet enjoy no good. Do not all go to one place. So this covers a lot of ideas, and we're going to focus on the idea of enjoyment. We should be enjoying our lives. You know, a lot of people uh, go through life, and they save up, and they save up, and they save up, and they never really enjoy themselves. I can remember my grandfather. He had worked very hard. He was a coal miner in western Pennsylvania, and at the end of his life, he had acquired, you know, some money that he had saved up. And my mother had always encouraged him to just, you know, go back to Poland, go back and see your homeland because he was a Polish immigrant and, and enjoy it. Just use your money. Don't worry about giving it to your kids. All of us are okay. You know, just enjoy the years that you have that are healthy and you're full of strength to go and do things you've always wanted to do. Sometimes the greatest evil is just not appreciating what we have. You know, we have these possessions because God does want us to be happy, right? And yet we don't do it. A stranger enjoys it. In other words, those that we buy things from. So we buy the mundane things of the world. The stranger enjoys our money, but we never actually do something that brings us real joy in life. And of course, this trend is changing in this day and age, which is great. Again, the rightfully earned money that we've earned, we should use to enjoy our life, but we should always remember to try and help other people to have a little bit of joy in their day too, by helping those in need. So don't become so frugal and want to save everything and invest everything that you just don't enjoy anything now. What happens if you put all of your money in a bank and the bank goes under? Recently in the United States, as of the time of this talk, like three banks have gone under and people are losing money, et cetera. Nothing is guaranteed. The world is illusory. So when God is giving you this gift of support, use some for your enjoyment, as well as helping other people. So be sensible. Yes, we should save money, but yes, we should also 
enjoy the blessings that God has given, that God has given us. It's really interesting here, one part that's kind of, that I would like to touch on for a few moments without overextending. It says a man may beget a hundred children and live many years, but however many are the days of his years, if he does not enjoy life's good things, the resources he attains through his work, or has no burial, I say that a stillborn child is better off than he. So it was considered very important for Jewish people to be buried in Israel and not outside of Israel. So if you did not have a proper burial in Israel, especially, specifically, then that was considered to be very uh, inauspicious, to say the least. So much so that certain uh, teachings of rabbis after the destruction of the Second Temple in 70 AD by the Romans, when the rabbinical, when rabbinical Judaism was being developed, a lot of the teachers would write in Haggadah uh, and in different Talmudic literature that uh, people that were in the Jewish diaspora that died when they were buried, there was tunnels underneath the earth, so to speak, that rolled downhill so that all the bodies of the dead Jews can be essentially buried in Israel. And this Haggadah was developed because it was considered very inauspicious to be not buried in Israel. And to be buried outside of Israel is essentially the same as not being buried properly at all. You know, so it was considered to be very inauspicious. They're saying that this very, very inauspicious non-burial of a Jew in Israel is it's just as bad not to enjoy life's good things that come to you. It's just as unsanctimonious. <laughs> so it's a very, uh, stressed point that we should be enjoying the good things of God too and not denying ourselves. So now we're kind of coming to this middle path. It's not about, oh, well, why are we just focusing on making money because we're going to lose it all when we die? Now it's saying, yeah, we're all going to die, but enjoy a little bit of it before you go. <laughs> so it's kind of like a very middle path. It's not denying money, but it's saying we have to be sensible about our money. So it's understanding that having resources to enjoy life is important, but it shouldn't be our sole focus. While living, we should focus on our comfort in alleviating suffering of others, while at the same time realizing that our main focus is on attaining communion with God. Good and bad. Ecclesiastes chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. Whatever has come to be has already been named, and it is known what human beings are, and that they are not able to dispute with those who are stronger. The more words, the more vanity. So how is one the better? For who knows what is good for mortals while they live the few days of their vain life, their illusory life, their ephemeral life? which they pass like a shadow. For who can tell them what will be after them under the sun? So this brings up a very important question. For who knows what is good for mortals while they live the few days of their illusory ephemeral life, which they pass? like a shadow. So different religions try and tell us what is good for us. And it is good to have a standard of understanding of what generally leads towards God consciousness and what generally takes us away from God consciousness. What takes us into communion with God through meditation and prayer and what takes us away. So, but then oftentimes religionists get very trapped in good and bad. And usually, and this greatly changes between societies, between religions, between sects of religions as to what is good and what is bad. Good and bad is very relative, very relative. What might be considered shockingly, shockingly bad in one culture can, can very well be considered holy or spiritual in another culture. 
So what happens in religions is that we tend to say that those that follow our way are good or saintly, and those who are not are going to hell, or they're not going to be saved, or in the very least, they're not going to grow spiritually because they, they don't have the true way of doing things. So here, the very wise writer of Ecclesiastes is writing, who really knows what's good for mortals while they live on life? How do we know it's good? How do we know it's bad? Is there any absolute good or bad in the world? Certainly there's relative good or bad. You know, there are certain things that are plain evil in the world. Uh, and I'm sure we can all think of a few of those without spending too much time on that here and now. But the idea is that even with our best intentions, think of it this way also, even with our very best of intentions, we often cause negative effects to happen, right? Our heart's in the right place, our mind's in the right place, we're following the spiritual teachings of our heart, and yet we still end up making things go down the wrong road. Things fall apart, uh, people's feelings are hurt, people think that we have a bad intention when we really don't. So who knows what's really good for us? Because even when we try to do good, according to our understanding, sometimes bad outcomes happen. So ultimately, due to this, the writer of Ecclesiastes is saying that even the ideas of good and bad are very illusory. Is there an absolute good or evil in the universe? Even Origen, one of the church fathers, uh, he said that even at the end of all ages, that Satan would be forgiven and be brought back into the heart of God, which most Christians don't accept. And ultimately, this became a heretical viewpoint. They called it heresy, that Origen said that. But, you know, God's son would be Satan if a Satan exists, right? What parent that is sane, that is rational, that is loving wouldn't forgive their child for making a mistake, right? And some people even say taking the devil's, uh, being the devil's advocate, pun intended, that sometimes even bad actions or evil actions result in good. For example, at this point in history, Putin and the Russian army have invaded Ukraine, a sovereign nation. And they've attacked, murdered, destroyed cities for no reason. It's totally evil. But then the good outcome of that great evil, that great tragedy, that huge loss of life, is that so many nations have come together to support this wrecked nation that is trying to protect its democracy. That's huge. So even though Putin, this dictator of our time, has decided that he wants to just attack a country in their own territory out of greed with all sorts of lies that he's told. It's a huge evil. But even good came out of that evil because forces for peace, forces for democracy, which allows people to choose their own lives and what's good for them, they came together to protect this other country at great financial loss to themselves. So who knows what is really good or evil? Only God really knows the eventual outcome. And of course, this shouldn't make us think, well, then, oh, it doesn't matter. We should try to do good in the world. But we should know that even good and bad have good, good actions have uncertain results. We should always have our hearts in the right direction, but we should expect nothing at all from ourselves or from other people. We should always do good, have good thoughts, good words, good deeds, but the outcome is up to God. The fruit of the action is up to God. For who can tell them what will be after them under the sun? Thank you so much, everybody. Good Shabbos. We'll talk again next Friday. Let's end with the second cup of blessing.
Heavenly Father, Divine Mother of the Universe, we bow down before you with hearts full of love. Help to purify our hearts, purify our consciousness, our mind, that we may be, that we may be receptacles for your divine wisdom. May we realize that even as we do good, we sometimes fail. But we may, may we not be discouraged. May we always seek the right path. May we enjoy all the good gifts you've given us. And if we have even a little bit of surplus, may we think of others that have nothing and try to support them in some way. Give us the strength to truly be your children and to truly serve our brothers and sisters. Amin, Amin, Amin. Good Shabbos, everybody. I hope to see you for the Liturgy of the Chalice on Sunday. Have a beautiful, restful weekend, immersed in God. I'll see you soon.